I grew up really lucky in the fact that I had disproportionate adversity in the first decade of my life. You know, I was born in Belarus. We came to the US when I was three. I lived in a studio apartment with eight family members. Um, you know, it was super immigrant, right? We didn't speak English. Like, you know, my, my, my dad, I didn't even know my dad until I was 14 years old and started working in his liquor store because he woke up to go to work before I woke up and he got home after I fell asleep. I went on one family vacation in my entire life you know, or two, excuse me, two in my entire high school life, both to Disney World in Orlando, you know, stayed in the Holiday Inn, like, we kept it humble, we didn't buy dumb shit, you know, like, you know, I basically wore liquor t-shirts my whole life through high school, because they were free <laughs> from the liquor store. Like, the level of humility, and a lot of my ability to not worry about others was predicated on circumstance. Like, you know, and I, I, I really think that I'm the beneficiary of very good parenting and very lucky circumstances. And those lucky circumstances in my mind was I was never handed anything ever, ever. And I genuinely, when I hear stories in culture of people thinking people that are trust fund babies are lucky, I just don't see the world that way. I actually think they're disproportionately unlucky. It would be my great devastation to end up being my children or my grandchildren. I mean it. That's just the way I'm wired. It doesn't mean they're wrong or I'm right. It just means that for me, the way I turned out, the chemicals in my body, the thought of being handed something or starting with that kind of thing where my achievements would always be undermined because everybody would say that it was handed to me would be devastating. That's the challenge of your next part of your life is raising affluent kids and keeping them on the ground. Oh, it's gonna be a piece of cake. I'm not giving them any fucking money. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 grew up, I grew up judging Bill Gates and Warren Buffett when I was younger of giving away their money because I grew up in an immigrant family where you, like, you help each other and I judged them heavily and I was super wrong because I had no context. I was like, that's crazy, to a charity, like what? And now I understand, I want my kids to be happy and I do not believe that disproportionately paying for their lifestyle puts them in a position to be happy, I really don't, I do not believe that. On the flip side, kids love to shit on their parents for doing that, but don't stop taking it. So, you're, you're gonna get lukewarm applause at USC for some of the kids here are like. <laughs> their, their parents are they're, they're here with real, the parents. It was a, it's, a, it's a really important point. I've been talking a lot about, look, I hate, I hate when people shit on millennials because the people that are shitting on the millennials are the one who fucking raised them. You're, they're shitting on the byproduct of what they've created. On the flip side, when I say that, the kids love that and they hit me up on DM, they're like, yeah, fuck my mom, she gave me too much. <laughs> like, I fucking hate, I hate it. And I'm like, and I reply and I'm like, cool dude, so give up unlimited Uber, asshole. <laughs> Get off the fucking payroll if you're so fucking unhappy. <laughs> but kids talk out of both sides of their mouth because they're hypocrites. Because they want to floss in front of their friends but what they don't realize is the quickest way to happiness is to stop taking the money. <laughs> it is. It's, uh, it, it, but it's a uh, lesson, it's it a lesson that you, it's, hard to it's hard to learn as, as you're younger in that age, as you get older you It's see super it. easy to learn, you just have to realize that it's true and you have to start valuing the opinions of your friends. You have to start valuing it? Stop. Or stop, okay, yeah, that's what I thought you said. Uh, yeah. I was like, that goes against everything that I think we're teaching. But uh, can you, and so why do you feel with your upbringing, and that, that's an advantage, why did you sort of always feel, you, you, you actually told my class, like I just feel you can't beat me, straight up. Why do you feel you have, <laughs> That was fun. Yeah. Why, why do you feel you sort of have a gear? Because, is it because you really enjoy the process and I the work? I don't think anybody, look, I do not think anybody who goes to college and studies entrepreneurship can beat me in entrepreneurship. That doesn't mean it's right. It, and it's just kind of how my brain works. Like, I feel like it's a craft. Like, I, I, I don't think like, I, I think of it as a, we have not defied entrepreneurship properly. Here's why, again, I absolutely believe people that go to school for entrepreneurship can get better at entrepreneurship from that process. I 
desperately believe that entrepreneurship is a talent similar to see, singing and playing sports and I think that I'm on that spectrum and that gives me confidence in this one little narrow thing of entrepreneurship because while everybody else was studying in school and like playing sports and doing whatever they were interested in, I was constantly entrepreneuring, right? And so I just have so much natural ability and so many years of practice that I feel like I'm on the extreme and that's why I'm confident about it. And so, yeah, I mean, chip on shoulder, right? Self-awareness and knowing your strengths. Could you sort of, not everybody heard that. Can you tell us what you mean by that and why you said it's the most important thing for an entrepreneur? I, I think of it in, in practicality. I, I don't think you get the same returns by overwhelmingly working on your weaknesses as you do on tripling down on your strengths. I don't know what else to say. Like, I re it's, it's so clear to me. I think so much of what I talk about is predicated on not only my successes, but watching my family members, watching that whole ecosystem of startup founders, uh, just watching. I watch a lot. I read a lot of like people's behavior more so than, you know, books or things of that nature. And so, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I believe that the entrepreneurs that have gone on to quadruple down on their strengths and then hire around their weaknesses have had much better success than the ones that dwell on their shortcomings because somebody they look up to was good at it and said it was important and they waste their time on something they'll never be. Like, most things are commodities. Like, almost nothing, in the scheme of things, there are very few things that matter. And most of the things that actually matter are predicated on emotional intelligence, not on information you know and deploy. So, you know, I don't know, I just, you know. And then you get into other things, like, when you talk about the current state of startups and venture capital and the whole thing, we're living in the greatest era of financial arbitrage machines, not actual businesses. Everybody's life right now is about CAC and LTV and hitting metrics to get the next fundraising round and has nothing to do with the end consumer. It's B2B finance game on the back end and that's why so many people are gonna lose. And yet, you still think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur in terms of the ability to raise money, and you know. Well, to me, it's not the last part. But yes, I mean, raising capital is a piece of cake right. today at a level that we've never seen. It's ludicrous. You know, the youngsters in this audience think it's normal to get somebody to give you money based on your idea at a four million dollar or six million dollar valuation. That makes me want to punch you in the face. <laughs> Because for anybody in here who's over 40, that is a ludicrous concept. But that is what happens when there's an enormous amount of money pumped into the system on the back of us not paying the piper properly in 2009 because we're soft as a culture. And so, this is a very fake entrepreneur environment. Like, when I see entrepreneurs that are failing in this environment with how much capital, with how little it costs to be in the game, with the internet at full scale, like, if you're an entrepreneur that's failing right now, that's a year or two in, you suck. <laughs> I mean it. You suck at entrepreneurship. Doesn't mean you suck. I, I suck at piano. <laughs> but let there be no mistake. If you're 18 to 24 months operating a business in this environment and you're not winning with all those advantages, you're not an A. And I think it's important because you don't have the perspective of history for, for people who are 20 years old. You know, you're in a lucky time where you can raise a half a million dollars on, a, on a, an okay idea. What happened, in, what, what did kids their age in 2008 when they graduated, what did they have to do? Not do that. Yeah, they'd go get a job. Correct. Every fucking morning and pray and, and say whatever is out there, thank God I am alive and my family's alive. That's the most important thing to me. On everything, I wake up every... I'm, I'm being real. <laughs> Nothing on earth scares me because every time I wake up and somebody didn't call me in the middle of the night, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm super pumped too. I wake up every morning fired up because I'm like, another day that something atrocious didn't happen to the nine people that I love the most. I mean it. Guys, perspective is the game. Like, 
realizing what we're talking about and then realizing the reason you shouldn't value everybody's opinions is because they don't actually give a fuck about your life. They're worried about their own. Like, get off your fucking high horse. Nobody gives a fuck about what's going on with you. Yeah. No, like, I, that's a I good agree. way to think about it. So, the cool, dude, so you've won life. 